What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. In the previous video of this series, we explained what Docker is and why we use it. Now, while doing that, we stumbled upon two very important pieces of terminology, images and containers. And after going through a lot of stuff, which you can check in the card above, we were still surprisingly light on exactly what a container is. So in today's video, we're going to give you a behind the scenes look at what a container is and how it is created on your machine. Now, to understand the container, you first need to have a little bit of background on how an operating system runs on a computer. You see, most operating systems have something called a kernel. The kernel is a running software process that governs access between all the programs that are running on your computer and all the physical hardware that is connected to your computer as well. Meaning, if you have different programs that your computer is running, such as Outlook or the terminal, etc., and if you attempt to make use of these programs to write something on your hard drive, it is the kernel that takes this information and eventually persists it to the hard drive. So the kernel is kind of this intermediate layer that governs access between these programs and your actual hard drive. The other important thing to understand here is that these running programs interact with the kernel through things called system calls. These are essentially like method invocations. You see the kernel kind of exposes different endpoints that take some amount of information and then that information will be written to the hard drive or memory or whatever else is required. Okay, now while keeping this entire system in mind, I want to pose a kind of hypothetical situation to you. I want you to imagine for just a second that we have two processes running on our computer and that to work properly, the first must have Python version 2 installed and the second must have version 3 installed. However, on our hard disk, we only have access to Python version 2. And for whatever crazy reason, we are not allowed to have two installations of Python at the same time. So as it stands right now, the first program would work properly because it has access to version 2 but the second would not because we do not have a copy of Python version 3. So how can we solve this issue? Well, one way to do it would be to make use of an operating system feature known as namespacing. With namespacing, we can look at all the different hardware resources connected to our computer and we can essentially segment our portions of these resources. So we could create a segment in our hard drive specifically dedicated to housing Python version 2 and make a second segment specifically dedicated to housing Python version 3. Then we need to make sure that the first program has access to this segment over here and the second has access to this segment over there at any time. So the kernel could say, okay, if the first or second programs are trying to read some information of the hard drive, I'm going to direct their calls respectively over to their corresponding little segment of the hard disk. Therefore, by making use of namespacing, we made sure that both our programs can work on the same machine. So with namespacing, we can isolate resources per a process or a group of processes. Meaning if a process asks for a resource, it is directed to its specific area in the hardware. Now, namespacing is not only used for hardware, it can also be used for software elements. So for example, we can namespace a process to restrict access to certain network devices or to restrict the ability to talk to other processes or to see other processes. These are all things that we can use namespacing for. Okay, very closely related to this idea of namespacing is another feature called control group. A control group can be used to limit the number of resources that a particular process can use. So namespacing is for saying, hey, this area of the memory is for this process. A control group can be used to limit the amount of memory that the process can use, the amount of hard drive input output, and the amount of network bandwidth as well. So by putting these two features together, we can really kind of isolate a single process and limit the number of resources it can talk to and the amount of bandwidth it can make use of. Now, as you might imagine, this section right here, running the process plus this little segment of resource that it can talk to, is what we refer to as container. So when people say I have a container, you really should not think of it as being like a physical construct that exists inside of your computer. Instead, a container is really a process or a set of processes that have a grouping of resources specifically assigned to it. Anytime you think about a container, think about some running process that sends a system call to a kernel. The kernel is going to look at that incoming system call and direct it to a very specific portion of the hard drive, the RAM, or whatever else it might need. Okay, now we get what a container is, but what is the real relation between one of these containers and an image? How does that single file eventually create this container? Well, here's what happens when we take an image and turn it into a container. First off, the kernel is going to isolate a little section of the hard drive and make it available to just this container. And so we can kind of imagine that after that little subset is created, the file snapshot inside the image is taken and placed into that little reverse segment of the hard drive. Meaning that inside of this very specific grouping of resources, we've got a little section that has the dependencies we need for this program and nothing else. 
the startup command is then executed and a new instance of that process is created. And that created process is then isolated and limited to that select set of resources inside the container. That's it. That is the relationship between a container and an image and that's how an image is taken and turned into a running container. Now, one last thing that I want to mention here is we spoke about the isolation of resources through a technique called namespacing. And we also said that we could limit the number of resources used with the help of control groups. Okay, these features are not included by default with all operating systems. You should know that namespacing and control groups are specific to the Linux operating system and not to Windows or Mac. And this might make you wonder how are we running Docker right now on our Windows machine? Well, when we installed Docker for Windows or for Mac, we installed a Linux virtual machine. So if Docker is running, we technically have a Linux virtual machine running on our computer and inside of this virtual machine is where all of these containers are going to be created, which means that inside the virtual machine we have a Linux kernel and that Linux kernel is going to be hosting resources processes inside of containers. And it's that Linux kernel that's going to oversee limiting or isolating access to different hardware resources. You can kind of see this Linux virtual machine in practice. If you run the docker version command at the terminal and look at the server, you'll notice that it states very specifically Linux as the operating system, meaning that Linux is what's being used to host all these different containers that you and I are going to be working with throughout this entire series. So that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching. Take care and I will see you in the next one.